All right, so number 26 is B, as in brother. I'm very proud of that one. Okay, so actually, before I get into this, I lied to you. I'm so sorry. I, I thought this was a different passage. I thought this was the one that was hard to read with easy questions. This is the one that was easy to read with really hard questions. So, yeah. All right, so 27 is C. 20, okay. 28 is D, as in dangerous. 29 is B, as in beautiful. Yeah. 30 is A, as in amazing. 31 is C, as in catastrophe. 32 is E, as in established. <laughs> 33 is B as in bountiful. Okay, any repeats on that first page? That's awesome, good. All right, 34. You ready? Uh, 34 is D as in dung beetle. I might have mixed it. 35 is A as in antelope. 36 is in, is uh, E as in extraordinary. 37 is A as in aardvark. 38 is C as in a cat. 39 is D as in dope. Yeah, this is my worst too. Still my best. I got Okay. Good. Okay. So if you got nine or above, you are already in great shape for the test. <laughs> so if you're not there yet, don't worry. We're going to do more of these. We're still only, we're still less than halfway through the year. So we've got plenty of time to work on your multiple choice skills. Um, if you are at the nine or above, then that is awesome. Doesn't mean we should slack off, but you're in a re you're in really good shape. So let's talk about which which questions you still even after discussing them with your group, you're like we still got these wrong. Yeah, Sam. Okay, start just right at the beginning. Uh, I thought this was a really tough one too. It was. It was a uh, process. It's a process of elimination for this one. So there's clues in the answers. A says that the author betrays a sense of resentment. And I think by the end, because he reveals that he is actually a lazy person, I think I, I illuminate the resentment part. He doesn't seem to resent the lazy because he does say it's like a biological like trait that you're born with, right? Uh, C says the author defines the scope of his argument by referring to all offers. Um, the author does not really talk about scope of laziness. He really only talks about laziness in one category, which is like uh, writing, you know, it, it doesn't talk about like every kind of laziness there is. So it couldn't be that one. D, it says, and I thought this one was a pretty good answer, that he expresses his anger by selecting the confrontational verb smacks. I do like that, but by the end, I don't, again, I don't feel like he is angry. I don't feel like that's his tone. I think his tone is more like amused with himself. So I erased that one for the, for the anger part. And then the author suggests the difficulty of the topic by describing something in two contrasting ways. Well, not really. He's not saying that those two some things are contrasting. He says, he says that they're the same right? It's something preemptive and it suggests or it smacks of a decision to refuse all offers. So it's something that means the same thing there. Yeah, Christian. What does preemptive mean? Preemptive is like um, before you even give it a chance. So I preemptively, I look at the role and I preemptively hate all my students. It would be like <laughs> that. <laughs> Um, or I preemptively love them all. I guess I don't always have to go negative. So with looking through all that, I look at B and I'm like, well, yeah, I guess that does that does work. It's not my favorite reading of it, but it is true, whereas the other ones don't feel totally true. I don't love this question. It's really, really difficult, but I think that's how they justify it. I would do a process of elimination with that one. Does that answer your question? Sure. Kind of. Okay. Uh, honestly, no, because the process of elimination, that was <laughs> That was still the first one that you went for. You, why didn't you feel like there is gave an authoritative stance? 
thing is, it's not like a strong piece of like rhetoric. Like, cause it's asking about a rhetorical analysis mm -hmm. and um, talking about there is, is it? It's not a super strong bit of rhetoric. Did you did you choose D? I chose A. So I chose A too. A, I think A is the second. Actually, A is a really good answer there too because he like it's like he resent he resents the fact that he is lazy, kind and, of a little bit. And yeah. even even if he says that he's lazy at the end, I don't. I'm lazy. My uh -huh. brains reflect that I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> but I still say, I, I still would say that even I have a resentment towards being lazy. Okay, so for those of you who, who got this one right and said B, how would you justify putting B instead? Yeah. I think the thing that was going through my mind is that it's very, like, the sentence in full is very matter-of-fact. Mm -hmm. It's, like, he, he's not, like, it, it's, he's stating a fact. Yeah. And so, like, that. That's it doesn't seem like he's betraying something underneath yeah. the surface of it all. Yeah. I think that's, I, that, that's the only way we could think of that one. Yeah. What are some other ones you want to go through? As helpful as that is. Yeah, Tiana. 29. Okay, let's do 29. This one's really tough too, I think. The author's writing in the first paragraph is characterized by the use of. Okay, there aren't a lot of short sentences in this. Um, so I eliminate that one because for a short sentence to really have a kind of punchy effect, it's gotta be really short. So I, I eliminate that one. Um, come back to the one that's true so that we can show. Adjectives used as nouns to criticize different groups. Now that one felt kind of true to me, so I moved on past that. I said dashes to indicate hesitation. Uh, the dashes don't indicate he hesitation. They indicate an aside, but he's not hesitating with those dashes. And then um, the last one, abstract language to obscure his point. I don't think his point is super obscure in that first section. Obscure means to like make it confusing, right? I, I don't think he does that. So then I go back to the two and I have to say, adjectives uses noun to criticize different groups or a series that broadens the scope of the discussion. All right, and what I did was I looked for adjectives that uh, portray different groups because I knew he used an adjective to portray one group, the lazy, right? But I couldn't find an adjective to portray the other, another group, the not lazy. I just saw the one to portray the lazy. So I was like, okay, so then I think it's got to be the series that brought the scope. So I went back and I checked and I see that we start with this idea that, that uh, lazy people are preemptive and then it moves into um, this idea that they are like betraying a social construct, which seems like a bigger, a bigger idea to me. So I was like, okay, a series that runs the scope of the discussion then would make a little bit of sense. So I chose that one. I did another process of elimination for that one, but I did think it was between B and C for me because he uses the adjectives once to describe the lazy, but not the other thing. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Tiana? Okay. Does anyone help, want to go through another one? Uh, 28. 28. Yeah, this is a really tough passage. Okay, in lines 12 through 14, the author's primary purpose is, so let's look at 12 through 14. It says, given that success hinges on understanding, using, and occasionally subverting the social contract, the lazy don't stand a chance. All right, I can't fully understand that sentence unless I go a little bit before. So even though it tells me I'm going to be critiquing 12 through 14, I still need to kind of get the, the context for it. So I go back and I say, the truly lazy are in effect refusing to affix their signatures to the social contracts. So they're not participating in, um, civic, in their civic duties, which basically means like, you know, the lazy, when they come to class, they won't raise their hand and participate. They won't get into the groups and discuss with each other. Like they're just gonna sit back and do nothing, which is a betrayal of the social contract, right? But then it says success hinges on kind of acting in and against that social contract. And if the lazy aren't even going to participate in that, then they're not going to be successful. That's kind of what that means. So I go into the question that says, um, assert the power of the social contract. That makes sense. If your success hinges on the social contract, then the social contract is very powerful. I get why it would be maybe to be wary of lazy people, 
um, because it's like they're not going to participate in this thing. But he actually frames it so that they're not going to be successful. Not that I'm not going to be successful because someone's lazy, but more that there's, it's going to be a personal kind of success. So I don't necessarily need to be wary of them. Was there another answer you put on 28? B. B. Okay, sorry. Trivialize the difficulties of being lazy. Okay, justify why you put B. I mean, like you said, like he's like making it out so that they are the ones that are failing. Mm, really yeah. Simple. And so that's like a difficulty for them because they. Yeah. Trivialize means to make it seem not important, though. Oh. And so there are other parts where I think he might trivialize, this be, trivialize being lazy, but not at that particular point. At that particular point, it's actually very important that they're lazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then you guys said you put C? Someone, did someone put C on 28? I did. Oh, okay. Um, do you see why that one's, that one's not right? Or should we go over that one? I, I don't want to go over it, so I can see why it's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Do we want to go over any of these other questions? Um, yeah, Tiana? Sorry. Um, 37. 37. Oh, good. I have to leave. Is there like something I have to leave? Not with this, but I'm going to give you the prompt that we're going to be looking at today. What you do is write a thesis. That's the thesis. You get out at 12.15, right? No? Or is it 12.10? 12.15. 12.10. 12.10. Are you lying to try and get to lunch no. early? No, 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 I'm just kidding. 11.30. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 37. The fifth pair, in the fifth paragraph, the author suggests that the truest answer, ah, this one I spent quite a lot of time on. I actually moved forward and did 38 and 39, and then I kind of gauged. Yeah, so I came back to this one. So he's talking about like taking this test of life, right? He says, um, what, uh, I want answers, or more precisely, one big answer. In a sense, life is like an examination that has only one question. The one that asks why you're taking the exam in the first place. Having been instructed to fill in the blank, an aptly phrased command, you ponder and then wonder if perhaps the truest answer is no answer at all. So he's talking about the truest answer to like why we live our lives, right? He's like, if life is an exam and we are trying to uh, maybe, and the exam question is, what is the answer to life? then he's saying maybe the truest answer is no answer at all, that there is no answer to life, right? So here I look and I say, it says requires a level of philosophical awareness that defies human expression. And I, I do see the philosophical awareness, so I'm gonna put a, little, I'll put a little mark by that, maybe this one. Is not worth providing if it cannot be revised from time to time. He doesn't really talk about re revision or changing your mind or anything like that. Yeah, and also the revision is like a way of being not lazy, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I eliminate that one. Would take too long to articulate within a single lifetime. I felt like that one, maybe. So I, I put a little mark by that one. Could not possibly describe the communal experience of all people. Uh, I could see why you could interpret it that way, but he's not actually talking about um, what other people feel like in that passage. He's really only talking about himself and how he would answer that. So I'm going to say no necessitates the type of intellectual discipline and rigor that few people possess. No, because he says he's lazy and he's asking this question, so then we know that it couldn't be E. So then it's kind of between C and A. Um, and I looked back and I was like, this idea that it would take too long to articulate, I don't think, he says, but in the end, because there is, after all, plenty of time to reflect, and you do want to leave the room, you hunker down and fill in the blank. So I actually think that he could articulate it. He just doesn't want to. And so this philosophical awareness, it does seem like this like big philosophical question that defies human expression. I don't want to actually um, sit down and articulate this idea. So I'm gonna go with A. Here's what it is. See, here's what it is. Would take too long to articulate within a single lifetime. I think he's saying that it can't actually be articulated. So I, it defies human expression. So I'm going to go with A. I think that's what it is. 
Okay. Is this helping at all? You want to go through another one? Yeah, Emily. 36. 36. The author assumes a self-important tone. Um, so yeah, in the end here, he starts talking about like how he's going, he like is a very lazy person. He says, as a solid constituent of the couchant class, I can say that the obligation to express does not weigh heavily. It's this super heightened language, right? Like using a French phrase and then you go down and you look at what that means. It just means lying on the belly with the head raised like a lion or a coat of arms. So he's using these like this high kind of highfalutin language. And yet what he's actually saying here is that he's, he's so lazy that his obligation to write is actually, he doesn't feel like much of an obligation. He doesn't feel much of an obligation to do anything. So when you look at it, he's not chastising, chastising his audience because he is uh, being mean about himself. He's not concealing indifference because it actually does seem like this question is very important to him. Um, he's not surprised because he seems to like understand this about himself and express indignation so as to distance himself from the lazy. He's actually saying, I am actually very lazy. So then the only thing less, left to think about is that he is mocking himself. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's move on from this. So if you are here taking this thing, I'm going to give you the points for taking it. We don't need to do test corrections for this. You can put it away. So Eli, that means you too. You're good. But for anybody that is watching our Zoom call from home, you guys need to take this quiz and turn in the answers. Let's get back to, to cannibalism. Oh, no. Although it's not cannibalism, like, did we talk about this in here? It's not cannibalism because the rich and the poor are different species. So it's fine for the rich to eat the poor. It just wouldn't be okay for the poor to eat the poor. Like, if we're walking into the class, not time to get back to cannibalism. Now it's time. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about eating babies. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm going to leave those doors open close for this one. Um, all right, so last time we had talked quite a lot about um, how the argument is actually logical, right? How we, we listed all the reasons why it makes sense to eat the poor, um, and we have decided that it actually would solve the problem, right? Like there would be less population. Um, there would be a, a money source for the poor. There would be exports for Ireland. Like it really does logically solve the problem. But then we were like, the thing that is totally missing here is the pathos part of it, right? Any kind of understanding of their, his human audience is completely gone. And that's how we know it's satire in part. So what I want you to do here at the beginning is with that same group that you were working with the, on, on the multiple choice, I want you to find these instances of satire in the piece. I want you to find incongruity, reversal, verbal irony, situational irony, exaggeration, understatement, and parody. So I want you to find one instance of each of these things in the text, and I just want you to label it next to it. Like here is an example of exaggeration. Some of these it's like all throughout, right? Like he's clearly exaggerating quite a lot in this, but you just write it to the side. Oh, this is a reversal. This is a congruity. Um, I'm going to give you, I don't know, 10 minutes or so to do this. It might take a little bit less than that. And you're just labeling that on your modest proposal. Um, does anyone need a copy of it? Okay, let me grab it. Pretty sure I have extras up here somewhere. Okay, will you pass out all the way back to the person who told me to learn? Maxon. Andrew. Does anyone else need one? I have a couple. Okay, awesome. Go for it. Oh, and you're doing this with, with your partners again because it's it's hard to do on your own. 
So Eli, you're just doing this on your own. You're writing in the margins, or you're at least finding instances in a modest proposal when he uses each of those things. And I'm just gonna write what those things are here in the chat box. So we've got incongruity. Okay, so you're finding an instance of one of these. Here's, let me just be um, a little bit clear about this because I've heard people be like, well, the whole thing is a parody. Absolutely. You're trying to find the moment when you figure out that it is parody and not real, right? Or the whole thing is kind of an understatement. You're trying to find that moment where it seems to be the most under, like the most amount of understatement or where it clues you in that it's an understatement because when he first published this, there were quite a few people who did not realize it was satire. So you're trying to be smarter than those old Brits and be like, well, I know it was satire right here. Okay. Oh, Eli, I am not sure what color. Oh, 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 you're still in the civil rights packet, aren't you? I passed out this modest proposal essay. Um, and so this will be in module. Sorry, I'm trying to find it. Okay, it's it's first in module November 30th and December 1st. It says homework, a modest proposal worksheet. If you click on that, the file for a modest proposal is just right in there. Um, and that has a full text. And I can actually, I can just get you it this way. Uh, it's everywhere. This is a really famous text. Okay, so here's a copy of it. I don't Did you write down when we, oh, when we had Zoom class, were you there when we did all the definitions? Yeah. So, if you, when, when I look for your rhetorical vocab stuff, I'll look for these. So, um, look them up. If you just Google them, satire, reversal, you'll find the definitions. Parody is mimicking another style. Okay, so 
We're all listening to you. I don't like when that Good example of irony, yes. Um, yeah, you can just write it separately. I'm kind of just like trusting that you're doing it along with us because you're a good student, so you won't have to submit it or anything. I just want you to work through that and see if you can find those. those. Points. Then, if you have a question about any of them, ask like Ben just asked what what one of the whether it was irony or not. You can just ask that in the chat box or turn on the microphone or whatever.
Should we move on? Let's move on. Okay. So hopefully you found a lot of those instances. So I mentioned a lot of people didn't quite know that this was fully satire. It, I would say a few people. Most people knew he was joking in some kind of way. But almost everybody did not think this was an appropriate thing to joke about. They either didn't think poverty in Ireland was very appropriate to joke about, that might have been the Irish who felt that way, or they didn't think that bringing up this idea of eating babies was an appropriate way to joke about it. That was more like the British. So they were really, this caused a lot of anger. Um, and I think if they had read it maybe a little more carefully and they found these instances of satire, they might have been a little bit more open to the message, but it did have the purpose that he wanted, which was like getting people's attention on an issue that people were almost willfully ignorant about, like close your eyes to this horror that is happening just across this, across this little channel, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not think about that. And he forced people to think about it, right? There is one instance of verbal irony that I want to go to, and it is a kind of verbal irony. So we're gonna add this word to your rhetorical vocab. So everyone pull up your rhetorical vocab form. And the word is apophasia. Apophasis, that's not it, it's phasis. Action. <laughs> there we go, apophasis. All right, I kind of love this strategy. I think I use this quite a, quite a lot. It is when a speaker brings up a subject by either denying it or denying that it should be brought up. Should be brought up. So like you're fighting with your, you know, your mom or something. And you're like, I'm not even going to bring up the time that you gave my sister this thing. And then you move on to the rest of the argument, right? Like, so like your mom, let me, let me, let's think of a better context here. Your mom is, you need $5 from your mom. I don't know. Why do you need $5? You can't buy $5 oh. for penny candy oh, <laughs> for a Jolly Rancher. What do you need it for? Drugs? <laughs> you need it for drugs from your mom? I need this $5 for drugs. Um, you'll bring it past events, like something like, oh, and I'm not even gonna talk about how you would totally give McKinsey this $5, and then you'd move on to the rest of your argument and be like, but I really need this $5 for my drug habit that I want you to support mom. <laughs> um, so it's like a way of bringing something up, but pretending that you're not bringing it up, right? Do you do this in arguments? I do this, I do this all the time. It's kind of like a, it's like this very passive aggressive, it's a very passive aggressive way of um, insulting people or kind of bringing past events into something that shouldn't be totally relevant anymore. That's what apophasis is mostly used for. So Swift has it a moment of, of apophasis, it's near the end. It is where he says, let no other man. So this is in the paragraph that starts, I can think of no one objection that will be pos that will possibly be raised against this proposal. <laughs> now that's clearly a moment of situational irony. Of course we imagine that everybody would have objections to this proposal, right? So him saying I can think of no one objection that will possibly be raised against this proposal is situational irony. It's the opposite of what we would expect. Here is where he has the verbal irony, though. If you look like 10 lines in where it says, therefore, let no man talk to me. He says, therefore, let no man talk to me of other expedients, of taxing our absentees at five shillings a pound, of using neither clothes nor household furniture except what is of our own growth and manufacture, of utterly rejecting the materials and instruments that promote foreign luxury, of curing the expensiveness of pride, vanity, idleness, and gaming in our women, of introducing a vein of parsimony, prudence, and temperance, of learning to love our country in, want, in the want of which we differ, even from Laplanders and the inhabitants of, I don't know, of quitting our animosities and factions, nor acting any longer like the Jews who were murdering one another at the very moment their city was taken. Here's his moment of anti-Semitism in here. 
um, of being a little cautious not to sell our country and conscience for nothing, of teaching landlords to have at least one degree of mercy toward their tenants. Lastly, of putting a spirit of honesty, industry, and skill into our shopkeepers, who, if a resolution can now be taken to buy only our native goods, would immediately unite to cheat and exact upon us in the price, the measure, and the goodness, nor could ever be brought to make one fair proposal of just dealing, though often and earnestly invited to it. So he says, therefore, let no man talk to me of any other plans that we could possibly have for curing poverty in Ireland. My plan, eating babies, is the best plan. Don't even talk to me about these other plans. And then he proceeds to list all the other little plans. What's he doing there? Why does he, why does he phrase it this way? Yeah, Lily. Because like he just suggested this like terrible idea. Yeah. And then he's like, but like, imagine these other terrible ideas that now sound so much less bad because I just told you to eat your children. Yes, exactly. So he brings up all of these things that he uh, is listing here. They are all, remember I told you he had written a whole bunch of proposals before a modest proposal in order to uh, fix poverty in Ireland. These were all ideas that were in those other proposals. So he was like, you know what we could do? We could avoid luxuries and we could ship our excess. We could give our excess money, um, tax us a little bit more. And, you know, we could use that to support the Irish. No one listened. Uh, you know, we could do, uh, we could ask landlords to have a little bit of mercy. No one listened, right? So he comes up with this crazy proposal um, as a way of kind of like pointing people towards these other little things. So why doesn't he just say, uh, we could do this? Or if, if you don't want to eat babies, we could do this other thing. Why does he bring it up in the apophasis format like this? Don't even let other people talk to me about this. Ben and then to Christina. I think it's kind of like in, in the poem also, kind of like this, what you let us do, and you did not care about that decision. Yeah. What you have brought upon yourself. Yeah, it is. It has that real mocking undertone to people who didn't listen before. So it's an accusation here. Christina? It's also more of a don't talk about this. He clearly didn't like these other proposals, which here's another one. Yeah, it's like almost, um, it's accusing them of not ever talking about it, right? So it's like mocking them and accusing them of let no man talk about this thing. He knows no one's talking about those other things, you know? He's the one that's bringing it up again. And yet, uh, like Lily said, it seems so much more appealing now because he has said something just so horrific, you know? So in the, in the um, example part of your rhetorical vocab, right, the therefore love, let no man talk to me of other expedients, just that line. Therefore let no man talk to me of other expedients. And then just write down a couple of the effects that we were talking about here, about why he would, he would phrase it this way. Okay. All right. So uh, we've been talking with this little satire unit about how satire can be difficult to analyze because there's always like a surface level argument and then there is some sort of underlying critique. Um, this is clearly critiquing something, right? But what exactly is it critiquing? What is the underlying, who do you think the target is 
or what do you think the target is of satire of swift satire? We talked about it being juvenilian, so we think something is evil here. What is evil? Hmm? Rich people? Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, here it is. He's talking about eat the poor. I think if we were to say that this is parody and it's verbal irony, then that we'd expect the opposite should be eat the rich, right? <laughs> I think that Swift would be a big eat the rich guy for sure, <laughs> even though he was one, not quite honestly. But okay, yeah, so we're critiquing the rich. I think it's even more specific than that. Who's the target? Like, who's going to be the most angry? That's another way you could think about satire. Who's going to be the most angry uh, reading this thing? Luke? The moms of the kids? The moms of the kids, yeah. They're not going to love that, right? Are they the ones being attacked, though? No. no. The children. The children aren't going to love being eaten. <laughs> <laughs> but they're not being attacked, yeah. The, rich people. the what? The rich people. The rich people, right? Yeah, because they're saying, like, they're kind of outraged. They're like, we would never eat children, but yeah. Yeah, good. So he's making this assumption, right? He assumes that the rich would love to eat the poor. And he makes this assumption based on um, sort of past circumstances, context, right? He's like, well, you certainly love taxing Ireland. You certainly love making poor people die in the streets of starvation. Um, you definitely love like all gaining all of the um, trade that you get from Ireland, right? So this is just one more step. You're obviously going to love the eating the poor, right? So we're critiquing the rich, um, and then specifically we're critiquing British rich, right? Because he publishes this in a British newspaper, he says that this is going to, that babies are going to be an export for Ireland. So I do think he's saying that like particularly British people are horrible. Now let's name what is he saying about them, rich British people? Like what's so bad about them? Because they aren't actually cannibals, right? Probably. <laughs> Probably not. We can we can't assume it about everybody, but most of them are cannibals. Yeah. They're like, selfish. Okay, good. So British aristocracy are selfish and how do we know that they are selfish like what are they doing that is so selfish they're not they doing anything <laughs> wait what were you saying they're not they're doing just, they're just not doing anything to solve the problems okay ignoring the problems in ireland there we go. And that's how we're going to get to the real argument. I really think that's helpful to think about if I were to read this satire as a different person, who would be the most upset reading this? Who would feel that they were attacked the most? Yeah, Christian. Um, honestly, probably Yes, definitely. Like it's the government officials who have imposed certain regulations that he really takes offense to as well. Yeah. Okay. So that's a modest proposal. Did you like this one? It wasn't, it wasn't a hundred percent effective. It definitely got people's attention. It didn't solve the famine in Ireland, um, but it did, uh, it continues to be read and thought about, which is more than you can say for his other tracks and the other things that he wrote for the paper. So. There we go. I think you guys liked it. <laughs> we had a good discussion. I think you guys are, are cannibal curious. <laughs> okay, so let's say you get a satire rhetorical analysis on the test. Then you're going to have to figure out what that underlying argument is, right? And that's going to be in your thesis statement. So let's practice this right in the other class. Uh, no. Okay, so this is one that was uh, on the test in 2009. I'm going to time you, I'm going to give you five minutes to read this and write a thesis statement. So it goes fast. I want you to write 
So the thesis statement, again, uh, just to be very clear, I want you to write the thesis statement for your rhetorical analysis of this. This is all you're going to have to do with this one. You're not going to actually write this essay. But pretend you have to and write a thesis statement for this essay. Okay, go for it. So Eli, yours is in the class recording for today. You can just do it on the actual paper, just, yeah. Good question, sorry. Yeah, you'll just write that thesis at the bottom of the paper. So Eli, it's called this.
So try and write your thesis for your hypothetical S rhetorical analysis about this text. Okay. All right. We've run out of time. Um, I wanted to show you mine and then we're going to workshop these next time. So if you would hang on to these yellow sheets so we can look at your thesis statements. But I said, by ironically using similar tactics of name calling and exaggeration on both sides, Wilson argues that extreme views on environmental politics will prevent communication and actual action. So he's not arguing for the environment or against the, who argues against the environment really, but he's not arguing for one or the other, he's talking about the way that they communicate and making fun of that idea. All right, but we'll talk about this more next time. Let's clean the desks. You don't have homework for next time, so you get a little break. I know. I missed I missed it. I Sorry, I have one more Did I get everyone's desk? Once it's clean, you can take off your lunch. <laughs>